Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to this teaching class for the Thames Valley and Watford Churches of Christ on the book of 1 Thessalonians. Today we're in chapter 4, looking at verses 1 to 12, and we're going to be focused on two issues, two essentials for pleasing God. Two essentials for pleasing God. Now, chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul has been reviewing his relationship with the Thessalonians, remembering them, how wonderful they are, how his affection for them was so strong. And he's got news from Timothy now that their affection for him is also very strong. They have pleasant memories, it says at the end of chapter three there. He's gone, he's been focused on the relationship for the last three chapters. Now he goes on to instructions. And a word uh, about those before we get into the detail, which is rather interesting, which is how often he uses the word should in chapter four, verses one to 12. Generally speaking, using the word should or ought in lessons and sermons is not always a good thing. In fact, they need to be used very sparingly. You may have sat in a lesson one time when somebody said, you ought to be more loving, more evangelistic, more prayerful, more devoted to your Bible study, more pure-hearted, more, more generous, more hospita- hospitable, more, I don't know, a long list, right? I don't know about you, but I find those lessons tremendously demotivating, not motivating. However, there's a place for being reminded about what we committed ourselves to, to be as Christ-like as we can. And I think this is Paul's point. When he writes about the shoulds here, he's not telling them something new. These are things he already instructed them about. As he says, we instructed you how to live earlier, chapter 4, verse 1. They already know these things. These are reminders, and they're reminders with the focus on Jesus Christ. He talks about God here, he talks about the Lord Jesus, he talks about the Holy Spirit. It's because we're not done growing. Remember how he feels about this church? unconditional affection and love and gratitude and 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 thinks of them as being strong spiritually they are at a model of love to the whole, all the churches in that whole region uh, uh, Archaea and, and Macedonia I mean if it turns to love they're the top dog church you know if anybody wants to know how to be a loving church go and visit the Thessalonians or go and talk to a member of that church because they'll instruct you you in Corinth you in Athens you in Berea so th- they're already at a high level but I think what Paul is doing is he doing two things? One, he's saying no room for complacency. Uh, you're doing great, but no room for complacency. Secondly, you're not Jesus yet, are you? There's still room for growth. And that's really important because every church or every local group has its strengths, but its strengths are still not quite at that top Christ-like level, are they? We've always got room to grow. And I think that's what's going on. And in that context, some shoulds can be and are in this context, in, such, in this situation, healthy. Now, on to the two essentials of pleasing God. As he says here, we taught you how to please God, chapter 4, verse 1. And that is how you're living. But now we ask you and urge you, it's a strong word, in the Lord Jesus, Jesus mentioned there again, more and more, room for growth. You know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. This is about Jesus, not about me, Paul is saying. And these instructions you know. And he first of all focuses on purity. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, holy. You should avoid sexual immorality, porneia, all kinds of sex outside marriage. Each of you should learn to control your own body. So self-control is part of what it means to be a Christian in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust, like the pagans. In other words, giving in because it just feels good and it seems right because it feels good. They don't know God. In this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Not entirely sure what that means. Lots of different um, lots of different theories in the commentaries I've read. Perhaps Christians were uh, taking each other's spouses off each other, um, maybe, or something like that. But anyway, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. Uh, so there is there are consequences. God knows what's going on. I warned you about that before. God didn't call us to be impure. So what's our calling? Where are we going? Are we called to be pure? to live a holy life, to walk in Christ in that way. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, Paul, but the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit, the one that's in us, right? He's thinking there of what he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 6, verse 18 and 19 and 20. Flee from sexual immorality, thinking about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Other sins are outside the body. Whoever sins sexually, that's in the body. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, in you. You've received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. That's the phrase that motivates me most. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You see, in that culture, immorality was expected. It wasn't the exception. 
and uh, sometimes the pagan temples were brothels basically um, as much as I feel like a place of worship um, immorality was at least tolerated if not actively encouraged a lot of the time is our society much different today I would say not we're fighting against the uh, swimming swimming against the tide here and so we have to develop self-control we've got to have habits that are strong and that's where the community comes in Remember, he's not writing here to individuals, although it applies. He's writing to a community. He's writing to a church saying, help each other with this so that you are characterized by holiness. You will fall. You will slip. You will make mistakes and you will sin in this area. I'm not sure any Christian is going to get through the entirety of their Christian life with a man or woman, old or young, without sinning in this area in some sense, whether it's physical immorality or whether it's pornography or whether it's lust. I'm not sure it's possible to get through life without a struggle and sinning in this area. But it's not about the it's not about the instances. It's about the trajectory. It's about the habits. It's about the atmosphere. It's about the ultimate desire we have to be as holy as Christ and not give in to what just seems natural and feels good. We want to live a holy life, not a life like everybody else. He says here at the end of that section, um, we are called to be to, to live a holy life. And that's interesting. Because Paul surely could not call the Thessalonians to something that they could not achieve, that they could not attain. What he's saying is, God's called you to this because he knows you can do it. You can live a holy life. Now, you're not going to live a sinless life, but you can live a holy life. And so what he's saying here is, you can live differently enough from the rest of the world that the world will notice, and it will be genuinely different, not out of a duty or following a rule, but because you want to be like Christ and because his spirit is in you and empowering you to live a life like his. I, that's inspiring. And yes, it's a challenge to live like this, but it's inspiring. We can live a holy, you can live, seriously, you can live a holy life. Not perfect, but a holy life. Your location, your family group can be uh, characterized by holiness. You may think, well, that's, I don't know. I mean, you know, we're all sinners and all that. Yes, yeah, indeed we are. But if God calls us to something, we can inhabit that. We can demonstrate that. Holiness is something you and I can live. We can walk like that. It's reassuring. We are people who breathe holy air, somebody once said. So the purity point here is very strong and it's very important. And we need to be characterized by purity. But secondly, the second part from verse 9 down to verse 12 is about love. Love's a big theme in Thessalonians, isn't it? It's a, it's a really good study to look at this. About love for each other, we don't need to write to you. You yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. That's a lovely phrase because this the phrase taught by God is a Greek word that it looks like Paul has made up. God taught. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. Hasn't been found anywhere else in Greek literature of its period. So he's saying, you know what, I have to make up a word here because the only one that can really show you how to live in this way is God himself. And he's the one to teach you. I mean, I'm reminding you, I'm sharing a few things, but actually, fundamentally, you need to be God taught to be able to do this. And that's why we have our times of quiet with God. That's why we pray. That's why we read God's word. It's because God is then able to, to strengthen us and empower us to live this kind of life. Taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. That's impressive. It's not only characteristically of them that they, they love deeply in their own fellowship, but they, uh, they love all the people in Macedonia, all the Christians in Macedonia, which is a very big area. So they, their love is spilling over. You might remember in chapter 3, he encourages them so that their love may increase, verse 12, and overflow for each other increase and overflow so it's flowing outside the local congregation and there's a point there for all of us that our relationships of love as christians must be certainly based in our local ministry but it should overflow to other ministries within a, a church like thames valley that means locations loving other locations or family groups loving other family groups but i think it also applies to churches beyond those borders so thames valley loving other churches watford loving other churches them feeling that love somehow that might be a good thing to discuss in your group. How can the next family group, the next location, or a church elsewhere, how can they feel the love that we have for them? How can we make sure we do genuinely love them? Because that's what happened there. He commends them for that. They love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet, he says, we urge you, strong word again, to do so more and more. Room for growth. 
make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Interesting how this is linked to love. Leading a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your hands so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders you, and that you will not be dependent on anybody. And of course, in that context, the dependency would be on other Christians. So he's saying, you know, one of the ways you love each other is by not being dependent on each other. Now, interdependent, yes, but not like I can't, I can't I'm not going to work. I'm just going to sit around twiddling my thumbs uh, because I know you'll take care of me because you love me, my brother. You love me, my sister. That's not what's going on here. We are taught by God, and God is not somebody who teaches us to, 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 to uh, sponge off other people when we can take care of ourselves. If we can't, that's a different thing. But if we can take care of ourselves, then that is something that we do. We do that more and more. And perhaps what's going on in this uh, situation in Thessalonia, which we'll come to in chapter, end of chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, is they're expecting the second coming of Christ. And perhaps some people are saying, you know what, Jesus is coming back any day now. So because of that, why, why should I be working, working with my hands, manual labor, which is often despised in that culture? Why should I be doing that when I could be evangelizing? Ah, yes, I know. I'll go evangelizing and I'm called to that and I'm really good at that. So therefore, I'll go and do that. And if you're not that convicted or you're not that inspired, well, that's OK. But then you can buy me lunch. You can buy me dinner. You can pay my rent because, you know, I'm the really spiritual one here. So I'm going to go and evangelize while you do your lowly work, which is not that spiritual. But you know what? But Jesus is coming back. And doesn't he want all men to be saved? Which is true. And doesn't he want as many people, uh, you know, baptized into Christ as possible? Well, yes. And isn't time short? <clears throat> Maybe it is. Well, therefore, let's go and save as many people as we can and neglect, neglect our health, neglect our families, neglect the fact that we need to look after ourselves and not be a burden on people. And Paul says, you got the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we should be urgent to help people become Christians. Yes, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back. But what we do know is, firstly, we don't know when. And secondly, to act in such a way to be a burden to other people is not loving. And, you know, we can talk about loving the lost out there as much as we like. But if we don't love the people here, then it's a travesty, if not hypocrisy, to go and try and love people out there if we're not loving the people here. We can do both, of course. But we must make sure that charity begins at home in that sense. So that, he says, you can win the respect of outsiders. Why would outsiders respect us if we're not looking after ourselves and looking after each other? Neglect at home and neglect at church is not something that outsiders are going to find inspiring. So, wrapping things up. Purity and love marked Christians out in those times. Marked them out. People could see that they were different by their purity and people could see they were different by the way they loved one another. Is it still the same today? What do you think? What is it that marks us Christians out in our culture and our society today? Is it the same things? I mean, the same things are important, but are those the things that mark us out? Not because we're trying to trying to stand out, but more that the, because of the priorities that we have, we will stand out and earn, hopefully, the respect of the people around us. What is, what is that in our culture or perhaps where you live? It might be different to where I am. What makes it clear to, that we are Christians to other people, even if, even if we don't tell them? Another question might be this. What helps your purity be pure? What helps you? What helps you to, to, to prioritize purity, to value it, and to walk it, that holy life that he talks about here, live that holy life? What helps your purity? And do your friends know? Do the people around you know what helps you to be pure? If we know what helps each other to be pure, we can help each other to be pure and to live a holy life. And lastly, what inspires you to love other people such that you are a blessing to them, not a burden? What inspires you? What helps you to love other people so deeply, so powerfully, so strongly, doing it more and more, that it ends up being a blessing to them and you take responsibility for your own life so you're not a burden to other people. I think it'd be really helpful to talk about that in our local group. So do please do that and let me know what you think. Post some answers online if you like. Or you can email me, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. We're going to go on to look at the next part of Chapter 4 next time. I hope you find this helpful. Thessalonians is an amazing book. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. And let me just uh, finish by uh, mentioning... What it says there at the beginning of chapter one, that is our theme verse for the year. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your ins endurance inspired 
by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Till the next time, take care.